Welcome to Become an Idol. I'm Dr. Robin Sargent, owner of Idol Courses. This is the place where newbies come to learn and veterans share their knowledge. I have here with me Matt Smith, and I actually connected with Matt Smith on LinkedIn quite a few years ago whenever I found his agency in Australia called Pure Learning, and now we've just connected again, and just with all of his years of experience in corporate instructional design, running his own agency, and now as a freelance instructional designer, I just know that he has a wealth of knowledge to share with us, and so Matt, will you please do a better job of introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks, Robin, and thank you for having me. Yes, so I have, have been in this industry for quite quite some time. I currently work as an independent advisor to companies. I help businesses get better at learning and I help L&D teams get better at what they do. As Robin mentioned, I'm previously the CEO of a digital learning agency called Pure Learning, where we focused on consulting and developing a lot of digital learning experiences or e-learning courses, animation, video as well, and worked with a, a huge amount of clients across a lot of industries, had a lot of fun with that. And yeah, I think at heart, I do. I do still consider myself a, a bit of an instructional designer. That's what I'm really passionate about. I love it. And you actually said that we you'd really like to share with us is some of those things that you may not realize or be told before you get into the instructional design field. And I'm sure everybody has kind of different things, but I am just mm -hmm. so curious about what yours are. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this probably leans a little bit more towards corporate because that's where where my my life has been as instructional designer. But I do see a lot of people that are very eager, especially in the last couple of years, to, to join this field of work. And I think there's a lot of promises around. Some of them are good and, and, and valuable and, and some of them are just a bit far off, I think, from most people's experience. So yeah, I really want to talk about some of the things that no one really openly um, talks about. I guess one to start off with is a bit of a harsh truth, but if you are working in corporate, I, I do hear a lot of people say, I want to get into learning and development because I really like helping people. And that's great. And, and that's you know kind of what I like about the field of learning and development. But when you work for corporate, you know, it, eventually you realize that it is ultimately about helping the business. It's that's your primary goal. Oh, that is a very, very true statement. And you see that in a couple of ways, don't you? I mean, where that mm. becomes clear to you, what are some of the examples you're thinking of? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, a, a really good one. We talk a lot about being human centered and, or, you know, really focusing on the audience, but ultimately you do have to be focused on those business goals. You, you can't just focus on, oh, it'd be great if these people would, would learn this or they could upskill in this. It, it is really about serving the business and the business needs. Otherwise they, they wouldn't be spending money hiring people. And I think that can just be a little bit of a shock when you, when you first get in there because you, you want to be really helpful and you might not brush up on you know, the business skills side of things. You might not learn so much about what, are, what is the business's goals, what's their strategic vision. And I think a lot of that can cause... It might not be obvious at first, but it can cause a lot of problems. And you know, I've seen new instructional designers be in meetings and just have really bad experiences with subject matter experts or senior stakeholders because they are focusing a bit too much on how we're going to help people. And you can kind of see something switch over in the, the stakeholders or the SMEs. We're like, no, but we really need to achieve this business outcome here. So you know, I think I th and I think some people are kind of sold this dream or they you know they they have this impression that they're going to come in and they're going to you know teach all these adults like you'd teach students you're going to make a real difference in their lives but I, I I don't want people going into industry having this rude shock where they realize actually no I am I am serving this corporation here I am serving their needs. Yeah and I like that this is like your first tip map because also if you can have that mindset at the very beginning that mm. You're not there just to help people in like this fluffy rainbow type of way, but instead it's about helping the business that you'll actually show up more as a professional and more respected in that role mm -hmm. if you come with that mindset, because that's yep. how everybody in that in their different roles, whether they're instructional designer or not, that's how they're judged, right? Is whether what they're doing is actually meeting any of those business goals. And so I think it would do a lot just for your, the way people perceive you 
that's that's right. I mean, another thing that I think is really important to understand is that business knowledge and skills is really just as important as your instructional design skills, which might seem a little bit strange, but when you do get into a business environment and you, if you haven't had any business experience, for instance, like if you're a teacher or, or something like that, for me, I came outside of, I was in the business world, but I wasn't exactly working for, you know, big corporations in skyscrapers and things like that. There was, you know, I, I felt most overwhelmed by all the acronyms and all the terminology. And I was working on some finance projects. I didn't really know much about finance. And I really underestimated how much you actually need to know about business as well. It just helps you so much when you're having conversations with subject matter experts. It's not your job to be the subject matter expert, but if you're constantly asking the subject matter experts really basic stuff, you know, you can get them offside a little bit. And it's just harder for you to ask the right questions. But then even more so, you know, when you're dealing with stakeholders, it can be tricky and, and they can lose faith in you very quickly if they think this person doesn't really understand our business or doesn't understand business in general. Yeah. So if you were to guide people down a path to start learning about business before they, you know, make the transition, what are some of the Things that you would give them like Google search terms or <laughs> books to yeah, read yeah. or resources. What yeah. would you say? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd, I'd be looking at some general business books. So I should have I should have made a list which would have been smart of me. But there's books like What the CEO Wants You to Know. And there's a lot of books that kind of reference, you know, pocket MBAs or speedy MBAs and things like that. Those, those are pretty good at getting a, a general grasp around basic business ideas. I think just doing a, some Google searches around how businesses are structured, what businesses are made up in terms of departments, and really doing a lot of research about the specific business you're actually joining as well. So having a look and just doing a search term in the Google News search and finding out what they've been doing recently, going on their Wikipedia page, if you have one, just to see the history of it, and then just digging around on LinkedIn to see what are the things that people are posting as well. It gives you a bit more of a feel for it. But what it also does is You'll find as you go through, there'll be references to things that people are saying, you know, on, on LinkedIn or in these articles that you don't understand. And then and then Google those. And then you'll just kind of go down this rabbit hole of understanding more and more about that business. And that'll that'll really help you out. Yeah, that those are all great tips. And then um, I just kind of thought of one more while you were mm. sharing that. Like if you wanted to know more about how business works and you have more specific questions after you've kind of gone down your rabbit holes you, or trails, whatever we're going to call them. You can also do an informational interview with somebody mm -hmm. who actually is familiar and has worked in corporate as well. Absolutely. And and I mean, social media, I was having this conversation with someone the other day. Social media is so great, especially LinkedIn for the corporate side, if you want to learn. And I think a lot of people are reluctant. I know I was this way. When I first started, I just kind of set up a LinkedIn profile and just sat there. But it is amazing how much information you can get for free and how many people that you might even look up to that would actually talk to you for free as well. So if you just start being active, start replying to things on LinkedIn, start reaching out to people, you can end up making some really great connections, which is, which is good for your career. But you also learn a lot as well. And I wouldn't be afraid to you know, look like you don't know what you're talking about or anything like that. If you're new in your career, people will see it on your LinkedIn profile. Go in there and ask questions. Prioritize learning. Don't prioritize appearing to be something you're not. Really get in there and just, just ask questions, DM people. You'll be so surprised at how much free time people are willing to give you just for free advice and to help because they were once like you. They they were once starting off. And yeah, this industry is full of people that are really lovely and, and really like giving up their time too. I love that. That is, I, that's so true. And just, I like how you just said, prioritize learning instead of like worrying about how you're perceived or what your image is. That's, that's, hmm. that's so good. Okay. So people are like, okay, well, all right. It's about helping the business and I need to know business knowledge. What, what are some, what's another one? Uh, I think, coming into the industry and learning about instructional design as well and what you want to do, you know, because there's, there's options where you can work full time for a business or you can be a freelancer or you could go and work for an agency. I would really do my research when you're looking for signing up to an academy or someone's course or you're subscribing or even just, you know, subscribing to someone's blog. I'd really look into how much experience that person has and what type of experience they have. 
because it is complicated. You know, you need a diverse range of skills in instructional design. And like we said, you also need that, that business expertise too. If someone's only been in the industry for a, for a few years and they set up a, you know, academy or something, you, you're not going to learn a, a huge amount from them. You know, they're still learning as well. And unfortunately, you know, it's a, it's the truth of our industry. There is a lot of businesses out there that, that teach very basic information and promise that you'll get lots of, you know, lots of job offers and, and high paying jobs and all that sort of stuff. When those people actually haven't, haven't done those things themselves or don't have the knowledge and experience that, that you'll really need. Yeah. So just doing your due diligence on who you're going to take your advice from. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, abso- absolutely. Because, you know, advice is funny. You, you, you can't, if you're new to an industry, you cannot identify what advice is is correct and what is wrong. You know, some advice sounds really good and you listen to it and go, wow, that's like, you know, that's going to revolutionize my career and that's fantastic and I'm going to be able to do so much with that. But then it turns out that the advice is is pretty shallow because that person themselves doesn't have a lot of real understanding around, you know, the technique or the tool they're talking about or, you know, the the industry or the profession themselves as well. So I'd really be just really think about it. You know, it is an inv- it, you should invest in yourself and you should learn, but you really do need to, you know, make sure that you are learning from from the right sources and the right people. A good way to mitigate that is from learning from lots of people for free online. And there's also a lot of heaps of free resources around for you to, for you to learn about instructional design as well. I, I would say that when you enter the field, that whatever you think instructional design is, you're probably pretty wrong about it. You know, I know, I know some people that go in and they think, yep, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to solve business problems and I'm going to be you know, doing all this really great stuff and I'm not going to be developing e-learning. And then you, you start and yep, you probably will be developing e-learning. But then at the same time, there's a lot of people that think that's, that's all you do as well. And it really varies from organization to organization. You have a bit of influence over that around how you conduct yourself and how you run workshops and, and, and how you suggest solutions. But then there's, there's also, there's so many different things that you can create and investigate and, and use in your solutions as an instructional designer. It's not just a binary of face-to-face training or e-learning. There's performance support, there's coaching, there's mentoring, there's all these different variations of electronic media that you could use. There's so many different physical interactions and personal interactions that you could help create or be a part of. So I'd, I'd really just consider that you know you are a bit of a be a bit of a blank slate come in there thinking that there's a lot more for you to learn but once you get into the role really think about what's the best thing for this situation you know don't don't go in there thinking this is what i've been told is the best this is what i learned in the course i did it's really about picking the best tool for the job or the best delivery method for the job and it's so that's what makes instructional design so tricky it's so diverse and so you know broad in in what we can do I know. I, I find myself saying all the time, oh, well, it depends. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. There's a, there's a lot of gray. Yep. <laughs> so were there any other, I mean, I know you were kind of already in corporate, but were there any other kind of surprises that you had at the beginning? I think, you know, it, <laughs> like you just said, it, it does, it does depend. I, I think one of the things that you probably, anyone will probably be surprised at eventually is how often that training is not the solution. So one thing I would say is really start Googling things like performance consulting or human performance technology or performance analysis and, and start thinking about that. Because as you go on in your career, you'll start to realize, actually, that training I developed a few years ago or that e-learning course I developed, I didn't really tackle the problem. There were some other factors that needed to be addressed before that. And I think if you really do care about learning and instructional design, one of the things you really should focus on is making sure that some sort of learning intervention, whatever you're creating, is actually the right thing you should be doing. You know, there's a bit of, I'm going to use the word integrity here, but I don't mean it in terms of like a, I mean it in terms of integrity around the skill and the discipline. You really need to be going into each situation thinking, I need to really prove that we've exhausted every other avenue before we've gone down the path of training first. Because if I just develop training because I've been asked to develop training and there's other reasons why people aren't performing or people aren't, aren't doing this thing, then my training is going to be useless. And then that's eventually that's going to reflect badly on you. It's going to cost the business money. And you know, the thing I think we don't think about enough is it has a, a real human cost of taking up people's time. If you develop a 
you know, a one hour course or a two day session. And then that is useless. And then, and, you know, a thousand people have gone through that. That's a lot of human potential and time that is, that has been wasted too. So I'd, I'd really be considering that and, and looking into that very early in, in your career, if you're just starting out. What about this one thing that I see quite a few of my own students kind of struggle with, and I, I find interesting. I'd like to hear your take on it, Matt. And that is, I find that they'll get the job and then they'll come back to me and they'll message me about something like they felt like the stakeholders kind of pushed them around. Mm-hmm. They they felt like, you know, the the subject matter experts were just kind of dominating what they did and dismissed all their ideas. Or some of them just kind of have a little bit of fear around kind of owning the project, owning their expertise. Mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So what are what are some of your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think one is is the mindset. So I think you you do need to go in. It's hard when you when you first start out and it's even hard when you're experienced is to think that I my role in this is to play a very specialized role here and to be the expert. And even though maybe I might only be a year or two into this, I need to still come in with that mindset because even if you've only had one or two years experience the subject matter experts and the stakeholders have had zero experience in doing what you're doing. So I think, you know, you, you shouldn't be pushing an image of yourself that isn't, isn't correct, but you do need to go in with that, that confidence. You do need to kind of stick up for yourself. I, I think a lot of people do get burnt out and want to leave and feel pretty despondent after a while if they don't establish themselves very quickly with that kind of presence where they're able to push back a bit. Business is full of pushing back. Business is full of negotiation. Business is full of, you know, disagreements. So, Really don't go in there and 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 start being an order taker because you'll develop a habit of becoming an order taker and it'll be hard to get out of it. So I think that is another thing that is 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 something that people don't tell you when you first get into instructional design on the corporate side is that yeah you've you've got to deal with a lot of ego and politics and a lot of you know if you haven't worked in the business world you you'll be surprised to find out that a lot of business decisions aren't logical and rational they are emotional and they're to do with you know people's own agendas or their that they just don't want to be you know look like someone else's idea is better there's all sorts of you know strange ways that that businesses work so you need to realize that you, you need to you can't win every argument through logic. It's very good to use data. It's very good to use logical arguments around why you should do a certain thing or why you're taking a certain approach. But you also need to understand that there are other things that play like egos and emotions as well. And so you need to also apply to the emotional side and, and do a bit of persuasion as well. One, one way to do that is to start the project off on a really good foot by really focusing on those business goals, really focusing on what is the performance we're trying to improve here and just always bringing it back to that as well and reminding people because what you'll find is as you're going through a a project or a program of some kind, things start to kind of fork off and people start, you know, focusing on things they shouldn't focus on, you know, the color of the button in the e-learning or what sort of snacks are going to be in the classroom. And those are all details you can sort out, but you'll find yourself in meetings where, you're spending 15 minutes debating those things and you, you know, you shouldn't be, there should be very quick decisions and you, you should be able to bring it back and say, okay, the purpose of what we're doing here is actually to help these people do this thing better and achieve these better results. Um, so let's go back to what, what our objectives are and let's focus on that. I think we're getting caught up a bit too much in the details. So you always need to be very mindful of that. And I think one other thing that I'd like to put in front of you too, Matt, um, that I, I think might surprise some people and I've, I've seen a couple of things. And that is that that deliverable, I mean, yes, training is not always a solution, but once it's determined that it is, mm-hmm. pushing out some type of deliverable, some type of work, like whether it's your outline, your scripts, your, you know, getting the whole thing done, that is, that is very important. And I don't think people realize, like, even if you, you know, are not getting everything you need from your subject matter expert or whatever, you still have to deliver something. You still have mm-hmm. to like earn your keep. You, have you, do you, did you find that as well? Can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you do. And it's, I think that's very much about expectations as well. And there's a few things in there. You know, a lot of people do have the expectation that L&D, their job is to produce content and, and run training. So there is that expectation. Yeah, we need this constant supply of stuff 
coming coming from you. So one part of that is is really setting expectations around your process. So if you're you know need to go in there at the start of a project and you run a workshop and you're asking questions about the business and about the user people might start going, yeah, but can't we just send you the slides and, and you can just make make that or can't we just tell you what you need to train? So you need to set really good expectations around this is the process we follow and 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 this is going to help the training or the you know content be much, much better. And so you need to do a lot of that with every interaction you're having. You need to really make it clear that you have a process and people understand this. What you're doing is just changing an expectation. You know, if I went to the mechanic and said, I need you to fix my car, and he said, oh, the carburetor's, bro- sorry, this is a bad analogy because I know nothing about cars, but the carburetor's broken. I, I need to go through that. But first, what I'm going to do is check these other things to make sure something else isn't causing that problem. I, I don't go in there and say, no, I just just fix my tires and it probably should work. You know, we're used to dealing with experts and understanding they have their own process and they have knowledge that we don't have. And so you need to set the expectation that you are the expert in your field and you have a process and you need to really stick to that process. Otherwise, you won't be able to do your job properly. And people do understand that. They do get it. The reason there is a conflict so much of the time is because they just have an expectation that things are different. They have an expectation that you are the people you send a bunch of source material to and you'll you'll pump out some stuff. But then, yeah, like you said, like once you are developing material, then yeah, you do you do have to get it out and you do have to get it out on time. I think one of the biggest ways that you can lose respect in a business is by missing deadlines. So you need to be really good at setting, you know, good deadlines. Don't say what they want to hear. If, if you're going to take a couple of days longer than they want you to, you have to call it out. You have to say, we just can't do that at the moment. We either have to remove things from scope or we have to add more resources onto the project or we... We just need to have a different timeline. If you just say yes and and you know take on a deadline you know you're not going to meet and then you don't meet it, you, you're going to lose uh, much more respect. So once again, people are used to having pushback and negotiation in businesses. Really think about that. And then the other thing I'd say about deliverables too is you need to, if you are someone who, who does become very focused on content development or has that as a big part of your job, really understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. If people are coming to you, and I've seen this a lot from running an agency, if people are coming to you and you're pumping out material that is of a quality that they could do themselves, they're going to go somewhere else. They're either going to do it themselves and they're going to think, why am I spending time in meetings when I could just spend the same time doing this myself? Or they're going to hire an agency. And I'd say 40 to 50% of my clients at Pure Learning were not learning and development teams, they were other parts of the business. And quite often I would say, is there any reason you're not working with the L&D team? Sometimes they would say, oh, they're just too busy. But the majority of the time they would say they they just don't have the skills to create what we want to create. So I'd, I'd really be thinking about, you know, if you do want to specialize down a particular path like e-learning, for instance, is is really developing the right skills. If you If you want to get good at visual design, don't search up visual design for e-learning go learn from graphic designers, go, go look at the work of graphic designers and go, go directly to the source. If you want to learn more about writing, go learn copywriting, learn UX writing, go and learn storytelling, go and learn a bit of journalism, which is, which is actually a, a really kind of transferable skill. Really go to the source around how, how do we develop this content? Because I think that the problem is in learning and development, we quite often just look at what everyone else does and we say that's the standard. But the people that we develop things for they don't they don't look at you know blogs and you know the articulate heroes challenges or anything like that what they look at is the apps they use the videos they watch the the shows they watch on tv everything they use in their personal life so they're going to judge material based on how it looks and how it feels and how they respond to it in their personal life and i think that's something that a lot of people don't quite understand so if you want to get to that level of skill and and create that level of material you're going to have to use the same sort of tools that those professionals use. You're going to have to develop the same skills. You're going to have to understand the same principles. So go directly to the source to learn a lot of that stuff. I love that. That is such great advice. That's right. Because like when you're designing for people, like they are immersed in the apps that are designed by professional graphic designers and UI and UX. Mm-hmm. And, and so their standards of quality when they are interacting, especially with e-learning, is a lot different than what maybe the industry standard might be for what's considered you know, good e-learning. And that's just, 
that's such mm. a great point. I love that you told yeah. them to go to the source. Thank you. I think maybe one other thing I haven't touched on as well, just from, you know, being a hiring manager, internal, but also, you know, having an agency as well and, and looked at lots of resumes and things like that. So maybe I know we're coming up on time, but maybe just to kind of close it out, some things that I've noticed, general advice kind of floating around. And like I said before, you know, some people are putting out a lot of advice, but maybe they're not very experienced. I know there are some people who, you know, teach people how to land jobs as instructional designers or freelancers but they themselves have never been in a position to hire a freelancer or actually to hire someone to be a full-time instructional designer themselves. So they don't, they're kind of giving advice that they're either hearing somewhere else and repackaging for themselves, or they're, I don't know, making it up. But a couple of things that I've noticed, you know, there's a lot of talk about kind of infographics or kind of visual resumes as well. I'd just be very mindful of, of that sort of stuff. Applicant tracking systems and CRMs can't, pull the data from those. And I think, you know, if you're a busy hiring manager and you're looking at hundreds of applications, if the data doesn't come through to your CRM, it's a, it's a sad, harsh truth, but a lot of people will just delete that entry and they won't dig into the files or the original application. And I'd also, you know, I've, I've had some visual resumes sent to me and like we we're just saying, they don't look like they're being created by a graphic designer and they're kind of hard to read. And that's been an instant kind of no from me. You know, I haven't gone further into looking at someone's portfolio or their their resume to understand their experience because I just get that. And, you know, it's either a templated thing, which I've seen a million of, or it is something that's, you know, not up to that same level of quality. And it, it is a bit of a turn off. And you've got to realize that when people are in a process of trying to find people to work for them, they get a lot of applications but they've got a million other things to do, especially if they're a business owner or a senior person. So anything like that is unnecessary friction for them. So they're going to discard a lot. And another one as well, which I think is, is is, it falls under this category of it depends. But what I would say to people is that portfolios are probably not as important as a lot of people on social media make them out to be. Some hiring managers really care about portfolios. Some of them look at them and they're helpful. Some of them don't care. A lot, I see a lot of people, some people, you know, message me and ask me to give advice on their portfolios. I can see how much time they've put into it. And you've really got to think about the, the return you're getting on that time. You know, a really elaborate portfolio you've spent lots of time kind of making look really, really pretty is, is good. But are you telling the story around what problem you're solving in the business? Are you just including a bunch of screenshots? You know, can you tell me about what your involvement is? The challenge with portfolios that hiring managers have is they don't know what exactly is yours and what isn't. And what I mean by that is if it is actual work you've worked on, what part of the project have you played? You know, I've got a lot of portfolios. I've looked at it and then I've given the applicant a challenge and they haven't produced anything near the quality they showed me. And then it turns out that they were, you know, a, they did QA on the project. So they, you know, edited a bit as well. So you need to be very hiring managers, you know, they're skeptical of this sort of stuff. And then having fake projects on, on portfolios that, that, you know, if you're experienced, I, I wouldn't do it. If you are new to industry, well, then of course, you're going to have to do that to, to show some things. I'd be very mindful of not designing something that you would like to do. I'd, I'd, you know, I, I saw a portfolio recently where it's, you know, it's, it's about something that someone's really passionate about, but it has absolutely no relation at all to anything. You know, they're creating a game around kind of some of their hobbies that it, it has no application to what sort of jobs they're applying for. So I'd really be mindful of, thinking about, well, what, what job do I want and what's the type of work I would do? I'd really consider that. I, I would also reach out to just, you know, people that work at companies you'd like to work for and, and ask them, what sort of projects do you do? I'm creating a portfolio at the moment. I would like to put some stuff together. What are the things you look for? Like I said, people are really open to that. But then on the other side, you know, I, I've hired IDs without, who haven't had portfolios. You know, I, I think a really good cover letter goes a long way if that's really compelling. I think if you can demonstrate your your skills and abilities live in an interview situation, that's really important as well. And so I just want, don't want people to think that the portfolio is the thing that will always get you the job. You know, it does depend on a lot, but also if you've just focused on your portfolio and then you interview very poorly, it doesn't matter how good your, your portfolio is. You, you're probably not going to get work. Yeah. It, that's so interesting. I hear you say, I usually tell my students do like you know, cause most of them are transitioning. So I say do a minimum mm -hmm. viable portfolio. 
mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Just, yeah. just something that, you know, you can, you know, demonstrate your skills. You can put it out there. You're always going to update it. You're always going to make it better later on as you grow. I mean, you, you're just where you are right now. So just like, let's get it done. Let's not spend a million hours, right? Because the mm-hmm. most amount of experience that you're going to get is actually on the job, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Those yeah. are those are great tips because I think a Thank lot you. of people, what's so funny is they I always call it like an MVP, minimum viable portfolio, because you know, even if you spend a million hours on your portfolio, your skills are just at a certain place where mm-hmm. you're just it's almost becomes like a loss of returns. Like yeah. a, it's like diminishing returns at a certain point of time that you spend on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've, I've, I've never had a portfolio and, you know, a lot of my experience has been in probably things that lend themselves to a portfolio, like the the digital learning or the e-learning side. And yeah, it's, I've been okay with that one. I'm not saying everyone should just stop doing them, but I think you just need to consider that. I know there's a lot of emphasis put on them out there. Like you need to make a portfolio. Portfolios are the key. And once again, like we're talking about before, you know, I think that comes from a lot of people who have haven't had much experience yet in the industry. And it's just a really good selling point to get you into their course or sign up to subscribe to their YouTube videos or whatever. But yeah, I mean, even, you know, something I would do as an agency is I would not want to show much previous work to clients because I wouldn't want them to... What you'll find is is they'll point out at something and they'll say, oh yeah, I, I want something like that. And then they get fixated. And then you're like, yeah, but that doesn't really fit. And, you know do we know so even just the visuals you know do we know the audience is going to respond well to that how about we do a little bit of work to understand what people care about and what their concerns are and what drives them so what we would do and and this is a bit easier when you're you're an agency but it's also something you can consider as a as a freelancer or someone starting out is is you can say give me a, a little bit of a brief and we're going to think about this and what we'll do is we'll do a, a quick mock up of what it could look like and this is not going to lock us in or, or guarantee it but We'll show you how we're going to solve the problem. We're going to explain exactly how it's going to be done. And we're going to show you what we'd think in terms of, you know, if it's, if it's e-learning or video or something, what visually it would look like. And that has served me well. That kind of positions you as, a, as an expert that shows that you're willing to really create something custom and really understand what the client, client situation is. But it also changes the conversation from that, oh yeah, you're the developer person that just makes stuff and here's a list of things. And they look at your portfolio or your list of work as a menu and they say, oh, I'll have items number 56 and 22, yeah. please. So that is another option. And if there is a business or someone you really want to work for, I wouldn't be shy in reaching out and saying, hey, listen, I noticed job applications you know, don't close for another two weeks. I would like to develop a, you know, a project or a mock-up. Give me, give me a bit of an example and, and I'll, I'll put it in there. I'll, I'll call it out in my portfolio. But there's, there's something that you can look at and that extra step might be enough to, to impress someone, especially if you're new. Wow, Matt, that was such good advice. I wish I had that advice. Uh, that, I, I could imagine that it would just change like that client conversation so much mm-hmm. whenever they get on the phone with you because they actually have something to talk about to discuss now mm-hmm. that yeah, now you've done some art of persuasion a little bit mm-hmm. on that client call because you yep. you actually have something like you know pretty tangible to show them about solving their problem and giving them something custom and then now you, a little bit of re- reciprocity is mm-hmm. built in there because you like Absolutely. built their mock-up for free that's yeah. brilliant and- i'm i'm stealing that idea i'll go tell my <laughs> go experience of boot camp oh. <laughs> go for it <laughs> Uh, excellent. No, and, so good. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, I was just going to say that, that's right. It changes the, the conversation from being sol- focused on a solution instead of content. And it does. It, it shows that you are going to create something that is actually specific for the problem, the audience, the subject matter, the, the organization, the culture. And that is really important just to change those expectations. Yes, I don't come in here with a bag of tricks that I just roll out every time. I don't come in here with a template. And and, I mean, some people do and that kind of works for them financially, I guess, but it's not a very good way to to go about helping businesses or people or furthering your own growth and skills. But it is, it's it's, it's positioning yourself as that expert. And if you do end up in that, stuck in that box of being an order taker for the rest of your career, you're going to have a lot of, miserable experiences. You're not going to like your job. I've, there are people I know who have been in this for five, 10 years and 
they've just got stuck in that order taker kind of hamster wheel and they desperately want to get out of the industry. And I don't think it's because the industry is not for them. I think they've just, they've been worn down. They've been broken. They don't know how to step away from this kind of identity that they've created for themselves around being an order taker in the business. And it's, it's, you're losing autonomy. You're, you're losing mastery and purpose. All the things that people enjoy about having a good creative job. Yeah. Okay. Matt, this has just been chock full of value. Thank you so much. Do you want to give any last tips and advice? or advice for those that are new instructional designers? I mean, you've already given a ton, but it's my last yeah, no, question. I think, yeah. yeah, I think I think just in summary, you know, do your research about pretty much everything, about jobs you're looking for, about who you're learning from, look around at what other people are saying, look around at things like, you know, social media sites like Reddit and LinkedIn about what people are saying there. And and really just 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 be aware that there is a lot of bad advice given out, either intentionally or unintentionally. And there are a lot of people that want to take your money. So just... Really, really think about that when you're when you're learning, and then when you get into the business side, reach out to people. I'm more than happy for you to connect with me on on LinkedIn and ask me some questions via DM or, or comment on some some posts or anything like that. So, take advantage of of all the all the technology that we have access to. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate all that you have shared with us today. Thank you, thank you very much for for making the time, and I, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Yes, you do. Great, thanks. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode at idlecourses.com. If you like this podcast and you want to become an instructional designer, an online learning developer, join me in the Idle Courses Academy where you'll learn to build all the assets you need to land your first instructional design job, early access to this podcast, tutorials for how to use the e-learning authoring tools, templates for everything course building, and paid instructional design experience opportunities. Go to idlecourses.com forward slash academy and enroll or get on the wait list. Now get out there and build transcendent courses.